front page of the paper. Um, 16 year old boy allegedly shoots bus, wow. and they had the, the four holes in the window wow. on the front page. And then no one had told me that no one hadn't died yet. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Bounce Back Podcast. I'm your host, Bobby, a.k.a. B. Luke. I got a special okay, guest okay. with me today. Introduce yourself, tell the people your name, where you're from, and a little bit about yourself. What's going on, y'all? Um, for those that don't know, my name's Exit Fame, artist from Boston. I'm a man in recovery, um, a man that wears many hats, I would say, you know, mm -hmm. I... I work in the recovery field. I do the music stuff. So just tell me a little bit about Boston and how it's broken down. What part of Boston you're from? Yeah, man. Again, Exit Fame. I um from a place and my street is half Roxbury, half Dorchester. Boston, it kind of consists of Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, High Park, Rosendale, South End, um, Jamaica Plain, you know. What was it like growing up in Roxbury? See a lot, you're exposed to a lot, you go through a lot, but it's choices. Um, I, I grew up with the type of family that is, um, I don't wanna say well off, but we were okay. So I guess what they call middle class, whatever. I came up from good people, but my father had his drug problem, my mother, um, you know what I mean, whatever they had going on. But for what they showed me and the love that they gave me was unconditional very warm, very sincere, caring. So I grew up in a very big family. I grew up around support. I grew up in a church community. I grew up, you know, I, I used the um, example in a lot of other interviews I said, if, for those who have heard me. In my household, I knew what Santa Claus was. We left cookies and milk out for Santa Claus. Like I went to Disney World before. These are experiences for the average kid where I grew up at. Didn't have those experiences or didn't do those things in their households. and. I grew up thinking those are normal. So I grew up with a, a pretty fair childhood. Um, you're exposed to things, you see things. I went through, my life got flipped upside down very early by the age of five. I would mm. say my brother died in a fire. The dynamic in my household was, you know what I mean? I got two sisters and I had my younger brother. They were both older than me, didn't live in my house with me. So I became, it was kind of like I was like a lonely child. Mm -hmm. Only child, whatever that word is. Lonely only, yeah. Yes. You know, I had my nieces and nephews upstairs and everything like that, but I became an attention seeker. In school, you were, with the person you would call the class clown, likes to fool around, likes you know what I mean? The jokes and all that kind of stuff. Oh, wait, I, this is me looking at my childhood back then, always seeking acceptance. I became a follower, mm -hmm. very good. And, and I, I became such a follower. I was, I yearned for acceptance or brotherhood or whatever you want to call it so yeah. bad that um, I became very good at being a follower. So whatever the task took to convince you that I was this or I was accepted and I didn't want to disappoint people, I would go above and beyond in that neighborhood. And unfortunately, when you're in those type of neighborhoods, it's not like growing up and we're going to jump off a cliff into the water. You know, right. it's like we're going to rob the cab stand or, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, we're going to rob the store or the car that's running at the gas station we're going to take in and run off with or the street gangs the neighborhoods and stuff like i i gravitated to that quickly Qu question uh, about yeah. so I, you lost your brother at a young age yeah is it i mean i know you were young at the time too did you notice something different about your mom or any or your parents i have vivid um memories of the situation of how it happened i remember being on the school bus i remember the school i was going to in jamaica plain I remember I used to get off the I used to get dropped off on the bus early and I remember going to the house where my brother cuz I used to get dropped off at my grandma's and I remember going there and I remember chaos and like it looked crazy outside of there and I remember a police officer talking to the bus driver and him dropping every kid off on the bus and me having to be last. I remember all of that. I don't remember exactly when I found out he died. I don't remember that part, but I remember um, seeing my father at my um, up the street on Facing Street at my um, my grandma at the time. I remember seeing him there, very distraught. I don't remember seeing my mother cry. No. I, never, I, I don't remember seeing that. And I remember the funeral, and I remember the, the small casket in front of the church. I remember those things. And you think it changed her a little bit? 
can only imagine um, losing your baby, your baby boy. The dynamic change in the household. I mean, this is me reflecting right, on it right. now. Right, right. Obviously, when you're five, you're not thinking like yeah. you're thinking now. It's just kind of all happening. It changed everything in the house. Yeah, it changed everything in the house. I mean, Lord only knows, you know what I mean? In that bedroom with my mom and dad, what, what they had to go through right. and um, how he had to be there for him or she had to be there for him. These are things that I've, I'm just considering right now right. as we're speaking. Um, how were you... As a student, my first suspension was off of a um, school bus rapping. Um, that's when the Dog Pound album came mm -hmm. out. Um, rapping that on a bus, man, those lyrics. Did that affect your grades? Did you have poor grades? It was so bad. Like, my, my stuff was so crazy in school that my dad had a system with the teachers where I, I would have to have this little notepad. In this little notepad, if Eric was good today, mm -hmm. I got a smiley face. And I, I, well, I don't know if there was check things or I forgot how it was. And she would leave little notes of how I was during that day. And this is when you can whoop your kids right. <laughs> and not get in yeah. trouble. I had let, let's. I mean, needless to say, I had more bad notes and more um, sad faces than um, good faces in, in elementary. I remember those days. What about high school? By that time, I was in full follower mode. You dropped out? No. Where'd you go to high school? So I started at Copley High. I was doing good. And then I got expelled from there. And, um, and I'm not and this is, I'm not making it look like it's cool that I right, got right, expelled. Right, right. Like, it was just... Well, I like to make the connection because a lot of times it is the same people who are having trouble in school and going through these things. Like they say, that school to, you know, prison pipelines. That's why I like to touch mm. on the whole... Yeah, just to kind of give people an idea, maybe the warning signs, too. If, if you're seeing your kid mm. going through stuff and struggling in high school that, you know, what's yeah, down and my the mother's, line. And my you know mom's, yeah, and she's seen it. She's, even when I was wrong, man, she was up inside those schools, man, just trying to vouch for me and just trying you. to keep me in there, man. Um, what kind of thing lead to you getting expelled? Did you just stop showing up or are you fighting? During summer school, they had these fancy fish or something like that in, <laughs> um, expensive fish i remember it was big yeah. and i i put I, I called myself cleaning all these tanks and i wasn't supposed to be in there anyway and i put all of these chemicals in the thing and all these fish died like wow. playing around on the third floor like hanging somebody out of a window right. like and then i was into graffiti tagging oh, okay. and i was that terror yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was tagging all the lockers i stayed like if you know me but this stuff started in middle school right all this behavior started in middle school. Like. When does you start getting in trouble now with the law? So I end up expelled and I end up so they have when you get expelled, they have this process where back then you would go to the Barron Center. I missed that era, the Barron Center era. Mm -hmm. So you would go to like they had this is when they started alternative schools. Yep. <laughs> um, they had places like McKinley. They had places like A B C D University High. They had I places. I went there. And Tremont Street A B C D. Yeah, I was there. Community Academy in Roxbury. Yeah, and I started going to Community Academy, and then um, I found what I, I I guess I found what I was looking for in um, the type of kids that I wanted to be around, mm -hmm. the kids that um, fit into what the music I'm listening to, what's cool, and all that kind of stuff i was i was big on hip-hop even as a child like that yeah. hip-hop has always been an influence on me yeah i just gravitated towards that you know who were some of your early influences in hip-hop snoop snoop, snoop like dog pound i was you leave it up to me ask my family i thought i was from long beach mm -hmm. california when like, do you get to the point from reciting snoop or anyone's lyrics to now you're writing your own so i would go to through i would listen to all different types of hip-hop i was big on crisscross i was big mm. on um Tupacalypse now um naughty by nature um what's that guy that used to sing tennessee lord i oh, gonna yeah, yeah, yeah. i remember that song i don't really? remember I, I, like music man like my father played all types of music i don't know who taught me how to write my first song like i don't mm -hmm. i just knew that listening to the like i just knew that the words rhymed when they talked so i just started writing yeah like you know what i mean like at a young age like i was performing at cookouts probably by the age of eight okay so you, yeah you were real young then yeah you like i just want but i wasn't doing it thinking i'm gonna be a rapper i was doing it thinking like i'm copying crisscross right. how old are you when your first arrest First arrest, we were just talking about this at my mother's birthday. Um, <laughs> I was at Toys R Us. This is when Toys R Us was in South Bay. I stole two toys. Like, 
I was a, I was a, I was in the WWF all that. Yeah, stuff. okay. And I, I loved Ultimate Warrior, mm -hmm. and they had him. And this was the first time I tried to walk around the store and be sneaky and take it out of the <laughs> thing. But I had my nephew with me, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm like 11, okay. or 12 or something like that. It's documented. I'm, I'm sure Whatever we can find out. <laughs> you were young, and yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. and that was your first time stealing. Yeah, and you got caught. I don't know if it was my first time, but it was the first time that I got caught. So you were fairly young when, um, when you start getting in trouble. When does it lead to like going to court? I had a chins, but there was a transition that, that happened. It had to be during a summer because I haven't gone to, because I went to, I went, because I, I caught a big serious charge very early. Okay. So I could put this together. So it had to be the summers, mm -hmm. like 13, 14 years old, like, 15 between these three years something happened where i can go outside and i i didn't have to be in the house my mother was working at my mother was a um air traffic controller mm -hmm. and she was working in providence see now it's coming to me and my dad he would work but I, um you know i mean my father was an addict too my father was a functional addict mm -hmm. and a lot of the stuff he did i don't know i like Cause my father used to whoop my behind, so I really don't know how I was leaving the house, but I was. But anyhow, it transitioned like that summer where I was hanging around a certain group of guys. I'm not coming home at night, and I'm I'm just being exposed like to smoking weed. Nope. Now I remember. See, I told <laughs> yeah, you it was gonna it come to I me. Know. I remember. I remember. I went to Alabama. My mom tried to send me to Alabama, Birmingham. She tried to send me down there for summer and i had these two older stepbrothers terry and tory rest in peace terry i did my first everything down there okay <laughs> um and i'm 13 years old i learned what a blood was i learned what a crip was i learned what project pat was i learned what what um pastor troy was like i mm. learned um i learned that culture i learned um it was the first time i smoked weed it was the mm. first time i drank hennessy um it was the first time I shot a gun. These things were all, and it wasn't like I was like trying to kill anybody. It's like down south, like people have guns and they yeah, shoot in the backyard. Yeah. That was the first time I, I did these things. It was the first time I seen people fight with violence over differences. Um, were you sent to Alabama because you kind of getting into trouble yeah, up here? Too? Yeah, so, okay, yeah, just, <laughs> yeah. And then um, my nephew's, my nephew's dad, he ended up getting shot a few times in Boston and I remember we had to take that flight back and I just was really sad and I wanted to go back but um did you like Alabama yeah man you know what I mean this is like everything Tupac's talking about his songs like mm -hmm. this is what you know what I mean like you know this is where I lost my virginity at mm -hmm. this was this like, that age yeah, that like, age, yeah. Like, like this is it this is it I, you know um, and then I came back with all of this exposure Were you Resentful for having to come back? You understood I, why? You I, just I got back. it. It was me and my nephew, Chris. We had to come back. His father, um, I'm 13 years old, of course, you know, and I'm a brat. I'm a spoiled brat probably still to this moment now. <laughs> and I remember going to the hospital at Brick, and this is when it was just city, Boston City Hospital. And I remember um, having him having to go see his dad in the, um, in the surgery room. And he got shot a few times, man. He was never the same after that. And I just remember just coming back. I guess now that I'm thinking about it, I don't want to say that I, you know what I mean, I zeroed in on this, but now that I think about it, I, I came back with a new type of confidence. Like, mm. I came back like, a little swag. I'm a gangster now, you know, <laughs> like, bring that southern swag. Yeah, yeah. I, like, and this is how much of a follower I was. I, you can ask people in my neighborhood. Came I came back, with back an accent? talking like, he was like, dude. <laughs> my, my dad been, I know my dad been in Florida for like 10 years now, and he, yeah. <laughs> well, 10 years it can happen, yeah, yeah. but not in no damn six months. So, <laughs> right, 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 you know right, what right. I mean? I'm talking like I'm, like I'm straight from Birmingham, Alabama. Oh. And, um, and I came back. It was still the summer. This is this is where things changed. Mm -hmm. I, I can see. Wow, you're making me think about my life. This Word. is dope. This is dope. <laughs> um, it was a summer night. These 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 people I was hanging with, they wasn't even bad kids. Like they were the pretty boys, and they were just trying to get girls and stuff. But they hang out. They hung out late, and whatever the case mm -hmm. may be. But um, my dad, my dad, he wasn't really happy about it. He wasn't like. I'm not just going to be doing what I want to do. Right. Now I understand how the transformation happened. So that night, uh, this was the last time I got my behind whooped by my father. 
I kind of like challenged them a little bit and I failed miserably. My aunt and sister, they heard it upstairs and all that kind of stuff. Somehow the police were called through the reports and all that kind of stuff. They just wanted to separate him. And they was like, you're going to cool it off because he was yelling like, this is my house and this and that. And um, they made him go to the um, they made him go to B2, which was the police station that night. I remember my mother talking to me like, should I go get him? Like, you know what I mean? And um, I remember saying, yeah, you know, and um, but when he came back, maybe he went through his own thing where it was like, this is when America was changing. You can't put your hands on your kids anymore. Like, mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. Now I can just do what I wanted to do. You know what I mean? And, and the type of consequences that the things that used to keep order in, in the household, you know what I mean? Now I'm, I'm already a curious child. Now my curiosities and my little experiences, and I might be mixing these days up, but this right, is where right, right. it led to. And next thing you know, I'm hanging out with the people that I was taught, like mm -hmm. in my direct neighborhood, my own gang, my own brotherhood, like Terry and Tori had with the their gangs down south. But now I have my own thing, like, yeah, man. What I kind of thing were you guys, things were you guys so doing Boston, when you're so posting up on the block? Boston, the, the, the gang culture in Boston has never been like Bloods and Crips and stuff like that. It was always like streets, projects, mm -hmm. like where you're from, your neighborhood and all that kind of stuff. I gravitated towards my area and who was around me. And um, I just found myself like I was back to the beginning of the conversation, mm -hmm. doing anything not anything, pause, you know right. what I mean? Nothing like that. But uh, just doing anything to prove myself that I'm a tough dude or mm -hmm. I'm a street dude, you know what I mean? And all that kind of stuff. Going above and beyond to put my, to um, jeopardize my freedom. Do you think you had to prove yourself a little more, coming more from a working class family as opposed to like a Section 8 baby? And they all knew, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. right, they, like yeah. they all knew, like, like we all grew up with each other, like, you know what I mean? Like. They all like I'm not a tough guy, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like I'm not the I'm not a rough kid, you know. Like you know, I ran from a neighborhood bully when I was a kid, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like these are things that was known. I think I had like two fights on my street with people from my neighborhood. But yeah, man, um, but Eric, you, Eric had arrived, you know. I'm right, Eric, right? You know, you. and um, I have arrived, and then I remember catching my first serious charge. It was in Cambridge Galleria. They used to have a place in Cambridge Galleria called KB Toys, and it was just these kids, man, and we was with the people from the neighborhood and next thing you know we're just brawling inside the mall with plastic bats throwing everything in the oh, store shit. at these kids and um we got arrested man you know that was that, that was my first time in a paddy wagon and oh, brought man. to the station the first time they took my thumb and put it down and I just felt like I was I was happy. I was like, mm -hmm. this is happening. Like, it was yeah. like a thrill almost. Yeah, it was like I felt like I was graduate. Like uh, you know what I mean? Like and that's how messed up our mind states are at that time. And that's why, I was you know, happy about it, man. Wild. I remember getting out and I remember riding my bike up the street with one of the dudes that um got arrested. With Waiting me. to tell somebody. I no, I didn't want to tell. I I expected people to know. You know what I mean? It was like he got his stripes, man, and it was off to the races from there though. And it just got more serious. Serious and more serious and more serious and so when's your first time in and, custody now you yeah it started getting crazy man it started getting wild my friend got killed with me it started getting wild guns started getting involved I kept going back I, I was going to DYS for violations now and now I'm doing drive-bys with people in stolen cars and um I remember the first time I actually had like shooting at somebody, man, like these things are happening. And then um, looking back on it, probably a rescue mission either would, would have happened to me or what I would have did that would have ruined my life. I ended up shooting three people in on a on a public bus. Yeah, man, it was that was. And how long in between that shooting and you getting arrested? So it was like a manhunt. Like, do um, you know there's a warrant for you? Or do you no, no, no. Nose? They got me within two hours. Okay. They got me within two hours, but um. Yeah, it happened in Dudley Station. You know, I, I ran, I got rid of the gun and all this kind of stuff. And I tried to change my clothes and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I just remember my heart just beating. Like, I'm thinking I killed somebody. Like, right. I, I can hear all the sirens. Like, this was, this happened at like two o'clock in the afternoon after school. Right. Like, the right. whole station's packed with people. Like, there's people everywhere, man. And um, I just remember everything that was going through my mind as I'm running. All right, you know. What was it? What was going through your mind? Man, I killed somebody, but it was like, I got to get away with this. I got to get rid of this stuff. I Are got, you almost like in the ocean, like in an immediate regretting what you did? Like, absolutely. You know, um, I was on my way to work. I was, I had a job at, um, I'm like, 
was that 15 and 16 at this time? Yeah. Yeah, and um, I'm I'm working at Mass General Hospital, um, giving patients trays and stuff. Wow. I, re I remember that day like the back of my hand, everything that happened. I'm running what? through. It's in February. I remember there was snow outside. And I'm the only person running while it's freezing cold outside, and right. I have a T-shirt on. They eventually figured out. One of the one of the people that got hit knew who I was. We was in, we went to A B C D University oh, High wow. together, and she um identified me. And they, now they knew who they were looking for. But because of all the gang activity in my neighborhood, they knew who I was. Like I've been arrested. Like I've been. Right. They, and they're like, we just seen him. So now they, they, you know what I mean. It wasn't long before they um they hit me with their car. And um, yeah, they brought me to, because it happened in Dudley, they brought me to Transit Police Station. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I remember all that. And I remember the a-hole cop man coming through there and him just saying, um, yep, you did it. This is, this is, you're, you're finished, kid. You're finished. Just tell us everything that happened. And it was just like, I knew to always be quiet. And you know what I mean? I, I knew to always be quiet. And then um, out of nowhere, really quick, my mom and my, was it my dad yet? He might have been there. And they came and let them come to the holding cell with me in the door. And, asked me what happened and it was kind of like just acting like I spilt milk in the house and I didn't do it trying to just mm. tell my mother like eh, this and that you know what I mean get me out and um that didn't happen and then I remember the next day it took me to a DYS center for arraignment it brought me to BMC downtown and I remember downstairs the um the court officer like literally front page of the paper um 16 year old boy allegedly shoots bus wow. and they had the, the four holes in the window wow. on the front page and then no one had told me that no one hadn't died yet so, so i'm like, thinking like i killed somebody and it's like and then i remember my father my father my godmother my mom being in the courtroom all these people in the courtroom and i remember them giving me a million dollar bail and i just wow. remember i turned around and looked at them i was like Wait, on. Nobody passed. When do you find out um, that nobody In court. Passed, it was attempted murder. Away. Attempted okay. murder charges. So um, a little bit of a, of a relief. I remember my father put his thumb up like. <laughs> it must have been a relief, A, yeah. knowing that somebody didn't die because of your actions, and B, you don't have to face the consequences of right. somebody dying because of your Immediately actions. hope comes upon you. Right. You know, and the, li the life. The life word. So you end up getting committed to your. 18. This is when the YO law. I don't want to say this is the first time where kids are just doing outrageous crimes, but this is the first time out of hand. where it's like we can't bring these kids, we can't bring these type of charges to these little local DYS centers. We can't just commit these people to 21 and they're taking people's lives. They're like, they're like you know, and um, this youthful offender law was designed where at the age of 17, you can be charged as an adult. My luck of the draw, I fell into that. And, yeah, my um, first charge was 17 and it was an adult case. When do you get out? I didn't get out until I was like almost 21. I remember that. So where did you go? Did you go to Plymouth? Yep. You went to Plymouth? That's when they started that serious yeah. unit for kids in Plymouth. So you know. I lived in there for a while, for a few years. They brought me to a place called um, Worcester Secure Treatment. I learned a lot there. Um, I, I lived, I had to, I was there and then I was there for another 24 months. They had these things called grid levels. I know my gotcha. grid level was 24 mm -hmm. and you, and you get like a, um, a hearing every six months with your okay. caseworker, the, the side. I remember that. Wow. It's all coming back. But eventually, obviously you do get out of there. Yeah. I mean, are you right back into doing the same thing or are you trying to do the right thing? So the treatment, nah. So my mind was right. I did good at that treatment center. Mm -hmm. I remember that. I, 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 the transition was crazy because I went from jail to this type of place. I started working on my stuff. They had me working closely with intense therapists and stuff like that, like going to these groups and talking about my life. Like, mm. very important piece of my life at that time. Is this, that the first time you start to look at your life? Yeah. And realize that? Yeah, you know, I, I, from like, this is how, this is how, yeah, because the therapist's name was Steve Lundrigan. Mm -hmm. That's how much I remembered, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? The work that he had me doing, understanding the cycles of right. what goes on through your mind with making choices and decisions. You know what I mean? And this is before drugs or alcohol is even involved. Right. This is just that stuff that we're talking about. Losing your brother at a young age, mm -hmm. wanting to be accepted. Like these are the, all of those mm -hmm. things that led up to you making this crazy choice. So you do get out. You do have the right mind. Yeah, frame, I get out. I make to get sucked back in. So, I mean, what happens? Anybody who gets out from, I guess, that amount of time, you go through this honeymoon phase, you get your... 
the girl mm -hmm. that was, you know what I mean? The most recent one that was writing you the letters right. and stuff. And I made my first child. I was working for a little bit. They still wouldn't let me. I had stipulations to not be able to live in my neighborhood. And because before, yeah, I don't know how this happened, but because I did go to a foster home when my friend died and they still had me in that type of care. I had to go to Lynn. I remember I was living in Lynn. That's where I made my son. I didn't make my son in Lynn, but because I would sneak to the neighborhood. But I was I was I was in Lynn, learning Lynn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um I was working at Olympia Sports at the Danvers Mall. Like, okay. wow, all, everything's coming back. Right. So you're trying to do the right thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying, man. You I'm trying, kid, but right? I'm I'm still where I'm from. I'm still, you know what I mean? All these kind of things. And um Are you like half in, half out, one yeah. foot in, one you still that's my you're life working, story. you're doing yeah, this, but you're still doing this. That's my life story. Yeah. You know, what I mean? not now, no, but eventually yeah. that comes to a head though, and then you end up catching some serious time as an adult, right? I ended up getting a really good job, man. I ended up working at Boston University Medical Center mm -hmm. with scientists in a lab and it was crazy. And then I found um I found out what hustling was. Mm -hmm. People from my neighborhood were coming to Lynn to sell drugs. I I bought my first car. I had my first car. I became, wow, now I understand. Yeah, so I became like, I would come through on the weekends with my little car and all that kind of stuff. I would come hang with them sometimes. I remember, man, just seeing them with money and all this kind of stuff. I remember I quit my job to sell drugs. Before you know it, man, like, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking, I'm going out, I'm smoking weed again. But even that, quitting your job to sell drugs is almost like that addict mentality because it's the instant gratification. Yeah, Everybody man, it was that money. and it was just, it, I think for me it was just about being cool. Yeah, still on that follower tip. It was just about being cool, man. Did you, you ever know? get caught for hustling? Yeah, they came to the, um, yeah, man, they had us under investigation in Lynn. It was like Grand Theft Auto, what wow. we was doing in Lynn. You know, it was, you know, the stuff that we were involved in was crazy. What's and that investigation lead to? More time? Yeah, place? yeah, yeah. They, um, yep, automatically my um, state sentence was um, imposed. They imposed the sentence. What was that? For? So what they gave me four to six four with to the six. time that I, they, they, they counted up as much time as they could. I'm skipping a time, I'm skipping an error because... The the Lynn situation, they gave me they gave me a chance. They gave me a chance. There was like I remember that like they couldn't pin me to stuff, but because of the the stipulations I violated, mm -hmm. they I went to Middleton. Yep, I went to Middleton and I did basically. Uh, um, I remember I had a H O. Here it is. I had a H O C sentence and a D O C sentence over my head. Depending on the violation, the D A could give me either one. Okay. Whatever, like, you know what I mean? And um, this one, they gave me a house, but all that time I did, now I remember, by the time I got to Middleton, I was eligible for parole. Yeah, and then I got out. And then we went right back to it, and then we took those activities to Brockton. Oh, okay. And then something serious happened in Brockton. Yeah, there was another shooting at a um, club. Now, yeah, okay. and that's, wow. when they, that's when they hit me. We was on the news again. Yeah. Okay. And that's now, when they hit Now, at this time, me. is everything wrapped from before? Because you did that nope. time? Or they just hit you just the, little just time, the, but we're keeping The this HOC. Program. That's so all. So they kept the superior probation. They, that's what they um, did. So you, now you got the superior probation violation wow. and a new new charge. Yeah. Now, Brockton, are you right in Plymouth for that one? So yep. Wait, we went right to Plymouth. We went right back to Plymouth. <laughs> yep. yep. We went, back, went to Plymouth. How long are you in Plymouth? And then do you go to trial? Well, I knew I was guilty. So, so no I was trial. I was the only one that knew I was done. So I had to go back and forth to Boston Court and, and then that get trip my trip alone to make you plead out, man. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, trip. yeah. <laughs> in that tuna can. It was on, man. Waiting to... Um, Took your probation time? My goal was to cop out to this um, assault and battery, deadly weapon, possession, firearm, shot foot, all this kind of stuff. My goal was to cop out to this and get it ran concurrent with the state. That was my only angle. Okay. And they gave it to me. Then I began the four to six. I began. With how much time I'm um, in on it? Do you, if you so this remember. is where it got sticky. For like the first six months, we had to keep going back and forth to court because they was like, he just messed up twice. We're not giving him the time credit that we gave him on the HOC sentence. We're not going to give yeah. him that. So we had to fight for it, and then they gave it to me. But for a while, I didn't think I was going to get it. So now, 
State, you get your state bid. Now you're in the big boys, man. Did you notice a difference when you get up there? Yeah, no. immediately. I mean, just the size, you know what I mean? It was like, you can probably compare it to the, um, the person at that age going into college and looking at the whole university exactly. and, and the anxiety and the overwhelmness that you, you, you experience. But the only difference is this is the place you heard all the rumors are about. This is the place that the enemies are. This mm -hmm. is the place that you hear about people getting. This is the place, like, yeah. this is the place where people die. Like, and this is all going through your mind, but at the same time, that instinct that I always had that being a follower, mm -hmm. I can adapt. I know how to blend. I know, you know what I mean, in, in, in situations and um, very good survival skills. Well, right? yeah, but definitely. Like you said, adapt. As I, humans, it's our nature. Adjust and adapt. Adjust and adapt. But it's almost like everything you've been through before that point, you know, the, the, the juvie, the going to Plymouth, you almost kind of prepared for it in a way, in a messed up way. Right. You know what I mean? Like I knew how to conduct myself immediately. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't, I don't think I was ever scared. Like right. I was never, you know what I mean? It was just like, this is what's happening. And um, and this was Concord classification? Yeah. Okay, you get up there. And Concord, you know, like you said, it, it, it's big. It's like the university. It feels so open, but it doesn't take very long for that openness to- To feel get, small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How it happens we, quick. And you're just thinking, like you're hearing all these rumors, Concord Farm across the street, and mm -hmm. you just, it's just what the human brain goes through. You know what I mean? Um. And then you always feel like make things out to be worse in your head. And then you get there and it's like, ah, it's not as bad as I thought. But that's dangerous because then you get comfortable there. And then that leads to people getting institutionalized when you get too comfortable. I think the, I think the um, institution and being institutionalized, I think that was instilled from just all the years with the Juvie and then mm -hmm. the, the, the Middleton and the Plymouth and all that kind of stuff. Because immediately I just gravitated to what I'm going to be doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, how am I going to get my mail? Where's the phone? Just ways of staying alive on the outside. I think at this point, is addiction a thing you've been dealing with yet? Nothing. The first statement, not even yet. So you get I, up I mean, we came, we came from that. We came, I came from that, that side of town, man, where it was like doing drugs and we don't do that. Yeah. We yeah. sell in, it. In the era. Yeah. Yeah. Like era it, too. It was like, yeah. it's different what? Now, you know what I mean? Like, that's un, like, if you do that, you're, you're what we call a fiend, a crackhead, mm -hmm. the people that we look down upon. Mm -hmm. So. That wasn't my... So what's your next move from Concord? You go, you see classification? Stayed there for a while. My first classification got skipped. It didn't get skipped. They had to re-look -look, look over it. So my first, what is it, six months? About that usually, yeah. Six months. So the six months, my six, so I, my, my six turned to nine months. Yeah, I was trying to get a minimum move, everybody. <laughs> yeah, like, right, it's right. My first, I wanted to get a minimum move. I heard all the... Did you have minimum points? I'm gang affiliated. You got to go through... A STG hearing, you got to go through the ips, like you got to, it just wasn't happening. Um, I stayed there for a while. I was like, well, can I do the permanent workforce? Like, it was like all these ideas. And right. then, um, and then that Plymouth van came, that Plymouth, that Plymouth, um, they, this was the first time where they were sending state inmates to Plymouth County. To do their time. Yeah. And wow. Then, I got swept on that. And you were already in Plymouth before, so and I'm knew, sure you weren't uh, excited when you heard that, new, that news because, like, state, you get the TV in the cell. You get a little bit more. Plymouth, you're not going to get all that. Am I correct? No, nah, you don't. So I got denied the minimum, and then I got that news. At that time, that was everybody, like the OGs and everybody was talking about, he was like, but you're going to get your good time quick. Okay. You know what I mean? You're automatic. Just walking through that door, you're getting your, like... They're giving good time as if you're a county inmate. So he was like, you're going to get, like, whatever. And, and you know, I've that's been, a silver lining. I mean, yeah, it's a good it, way to have find something positive yeah, out of and it a was, negative um, situation. I've been there before. I knew what it was. I didn't really care. At I remember. Point, I was you, just like, whatever. I are, remember. You, are you writing raps at this point? Are you oh, yeah. I your to, skills yeah, now? Yeah, like you said yeah. you started at through, eight, through, so now you the, must. Every, through the whole, the whole, everything that we've been talking about, I just never brought it up just now. This whole time I'm writing raps. Do you I had think that books. was like I had outlet? books. Oh yeah, Some it was therapy outlet. for me. Mm, why? It Talk was therapy. That. Um, it was just expressing my thing. It was just another way. Like people liked hearing me rap. It, mm. it was a way of getting validation. Um, feeling good about myself. Um, took you out of your head. Mm. You know what I mean? It gave you something to aspire to. It gave you something. To, it, it gave you something to have a dream about. Like I had goals, like like you would at that time you would hear eighty eight nine, you would hear, um, I think it was Hustle Simmons at that time. Like you would hear these people on, 
um, jamming 94.5 and all that. And you hearing was, anybody that you know personally at so this I had point a friend, now? Yeah, I had a friend from my neighborhood who was um, cool. He um, associated with Triple Threat, and okay. they was on the radio a yep, lot. I remember and, um, hearing them. And I would be like, nah, I know these dudes and all that. But that's got to be more inspiration. Like, I know this dude. This dude's on the radio. I can do this, too. For me, being on the radio and being on TV, that was always, like, magic to me. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it always seemed like magic. Like, how does that happen? And um, it was always fascinating and, am and amazing to me. Well, that's the things we have. We grow up, and we don't even realize we have these limited beliefs. That was a limited belief. That's magic. I could, You know what I mean? That's something that's out of my grasp of reality, but it's really not. Right. People, parents, uncles, friends, oh, you can never do that. People give you a million reasons why you can't do something when you're just sitting here looking for one reason why you can, you know? That's how I look at it. But there's definitely something to be said for writing in general, anything. And I think when writing raps, like I used to do the same thing. I wrote a lot of raps, but for me, it was less about the rhyming. And I just wanted to get stuff on paper, but it's like, Oh, we, I grow up, like, learned, like, it's not really a masculine thing for a guy to be like, let me write in my journal. Like, I feel like a lot of females growing up, they had their diary. Being, like, from an urban environment, that's not cool not to really. write in a journal, right? Yeah, like, yeah. that's weird. Right, right. Like, so it's safe. It's safe. And it, that's how I look at it. Right. Like, look, it was almost like a, a, a way to, an outlet that's at least more socially acceptable than sitting there like, yo, I'm going to go journal for a little bit. You know what I mean? And it's right. like, like, look at you like that. How important was having that outlet through your bed, man? Because those rap notebooks followed me everywhere I went. Any room, any cell move, any any unit move, any jail move, anywhere I went. When I got home, I had notebooks of them. Was there ever an instance where you had to kind of be adamant about, I need my stuff? You know how it is. You move from one place to another. I never had a situation where I lost my stuff or nothing like that. Do you do your whole... Stay bid there in Plymouth? The first one. You wrapped up from Plymouth? I got parole. <laughs> okay, you got parole, but you paroled yeah, from yeah. Plymouth? You didn't hit a minimum? Can't go to minimum. Because of the STG thing. Yeah, I can't so go to minimum. So just explain that. A strategic threat group, basically you're in a gang, um, because of my neighborhood affiliation. So my... you're, it wasn't even like a, a color affiliation with you, right? It, it, no, I'm from it, Boston, so I was from Faston Street, like, like I said in the so beginning. So for you, that's a neighborhood, but to them, that's a gang. Absolutely. That's, you know, that's what... Yeah, Faston Street, Big Head Boys, Brunswick Street, like that whole area, like um, the, 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 um, the affiliations, the people that you're involved in, the type of crime that you're in there for, all the stuff that your police report, everything, your, your D reports, everything. And then the gang unit that's on the street, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They identify, they communicate with the um, Ips and all that kind wow. of stuff. So I've been out of it for a while now. I don't know... I imagine they use the same tactics. Why would they change it? It worked. But they probably have advanced tactics now for the new generation. So but. what's your parole like? You get paroled, same thing? You can't go back to your neighborhood? Nah, Where this you, time what? the, the, the um, oh, DYS games are out the window. Okay. If you're going to your mother's house, you're going to your mother's house. You're yeah, going yeah. like wherever, you know what I mean? Did um, you complete the parole? No. Was it more like a mindset thing? Because I, my parole in my head... It was a furlough. I'll be back home myself. Like, really, that's how I look. And it's messed up at it, as it was at the time. And it was, like, going towards the winter months. I told my celly, like, hold this out. Or don't move in somebody that you want to stay there because I'll be back. Oh, no. Nah, I, nah, I didn't have the intentions of coming back. Wow. I forgot exactly why the violation happened. Yeah, that brought me to Walpole. I don't remember how. I remember I, I, went, to, I went to OU1. Yeah, I... It would come to me. Now, I don't this, remember exactly what I did. Did Walpole, was Walpole classification now when you went back? I think it was the beginning. Like, it was transitioning into it. They were getting the people who were on the units who were there, who's going to stay there. Because basically, I'm short at this point. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm two years and under at this point. So. And that time on the street count, day for day. Yeah, I'm, I'm two years, yeah, I'm two years and under at this point. Do you remember how long you were on the streets? Because the person that was in my life at that time... I know the activities that I was involved in. I just I'm trying to think okay. of the I'm trying to think of the violation and what made them bring me to what made them bring me back in and go in front, but it's not coming yeah, to me. Right well now. the details aren't super important. Yeah, at, but at I this went back point, for, are you um are you into the, the drugs and no. the alcohol? You still not, not even a thing yet. No. Nope. Okay. When does your journey begin with that? So I get out again. And we're doing the, and, and this is when the um, alias of Fame Flint, I was the rapper Fame Flint, and this is when that stuff was taken off. A lot of drug selling, the pimping, the strip clubs, Miami traveling, back and forth to New York. This is when 
Um, this is around the time of the Craigslist killer, back page, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. I'm involved in all of that stuff now. It's all, you know what I mean? All that kind of stuff and doing the music. Like we had a, we, we, you know what I mean? Everything that, like I told you, was magic to me or mm -hmm. I thought was impossible, I did. It got on the radio. We mm -hmm. made videos. This is when YouTube, having videos on YouTube, wow. you know what I mean? Instagram, all you could do was post a picture on it. Like mm -hmm. this, like there was no videos on it. Like Facebook was just a picture. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't really big like that yet. This was that era. And so when does your abuse of, of drugs begin? Is that something you started off partying? What ended up happening, the reason why that ended up happening to me, I mean, I was around it. I was selling everything and doing all that kind of stuff. I brought stuff into my home. You know what I mean? I told you my father was an addict. I had stuff in my house. I've had all different type of stuff in my house. And um, at that time, you know what I mean? Um, I've smoked weed with my father. I I think he's I think he has gotten like little 20 bumps of um coke before from me or my friend. You know what I mean? Like these are things that have happened. It's not on the same timeline, but these are things that have happened. So there was a comfortability there. But I remember him going into treatment in between all of this stuff from DYS to all that. Like mm -hmm. there was a time when I would get out and he would go to treatment. Like there was a time when we didn't get along, you know. Yeah. Anyway, he got his life together. He got back involved in the church while I was away. Like he was back with my mom. Like, I mean, he was always with my mom. He never mm -hmm. left. I would assume there was, you know what I mean? The good, the, the good part of their relationship. So anyhow, I got stuff inside the house. I'm bringing stuff in. And I guess he was peeking around and um, I came back, I came back into the house and I seen one of my stash, it's one of the stashes I had, it was all disarrayed and everything like that. And I remember going to him in the bathroom in, my, in the house and I remember seeing him look, you know what I mean, very bizarre, you know what I mean, you could see that um, he was out of it, like trying to act like he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember just telling him, you know, this is when Perk, thir Perk 30s, the real ones had just came out. Like, this is that era. Yeah. And I remember just being mad and yelling at him. And then I remember coming back and finding him dead. That guilt, it was like, I always felt like I killed my dad. I always, you know, I ruined my mother. I ruined the household and all this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? My oldest lived with us. I just went, I just, I just stopped caring. Yeah. I just stopped caring about a lot of the stuff I was doing. Um, the stuff with the girls, giving them the stuff to sell in the club. There was no more bagging with yeah. caution anymore. Did like you stop caring about yourself? After everything happened, I went to Miami and this was my, my first experience of all drugs. Like, I mean, like I remember trying ecstasy for the first time and I'm about the age, you know, I got into drugs late. So mm -hmm. I'm about the age of like 26, 27. And I remember like trying ecstasy. I was with some dude from the uh, Miami Dolphins, and wow. we was at Club Space, and um, I remember that. I remember, um, I remember sniffing coke for the first time on Miami Beach, and then um, I just remember all those little things. And then I came back up here. I had like a little. I mean, I had like an enterprise going inside these strip clubs. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the, it didn't seem like it when you're in it, in it but. Um, I just stopped caring. I stopped caring about collecting money. I stopped caring about what was going. It was just, and then I remember um, downtown Boston, the glass slipper. The first time where I sniffed coke by myself. Mm. See, there's a difference I feel like with drug use. Like if you're around people and it's like the club type of thing, and I'm not condoning that, but it's like, and you do like a little bump or something, you know what I mean? Mm. Like all of it's bad, but then you just move on, you right. know what I mean? It's like it's a social thing. It, yeah. it, it was like you didn't, you're not thinking about it, but I remember like the first time like I went into a bathroom stall inside the glass slipper mm -hmm. and stuff that I'm supposed to be selling, I'm opening up and I'm sniffing mm -hmm. it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and I remember walking out the thing and I remember just some guys like, you got stuff on your face, man. And, oh, you know, shit. and I remember like, you know, I, I'm messing up. I'm messing up. You and know, you knew I, that immediately that first These day. things yeah. are not supposed to be done. And, and, and that just. Yeah, man, and that just transpired, man. Um, I tried a perk thirty. I remember being on Revere Beach, man. Um, one of the girls that we were dealing with, she had um this spot, in on the Revere Beach, and I remember we, that's where we used to go and count all the money every night. Nice place. Um, and I remember they're all in there laughing, doing their thing, cause it was cool. The girls can do the drugs, but you're not supposed to. You know what I mean? Right. You're supposed to be the dealer. And I remember my first sniff of brown. This is when it was no fentanyl and brown. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like I remember that. 
I guess the, that's what we call dabbling. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so I'm a dabbler at this right. point. I'm a dabbler. I just use the expression to like, uh, I use the, the analogy, the expression, whatever, to explain the digression, to explain it. Yeah. The, the Beamer turned into a Toyota. The Toyota turned into a rental. The rental turned into my mother's car. My mother's car turned into a bus pass. And before you know it, I'm sneaking on the train. Mm -hmm. There was no more being able to go to the club anymore. There was no more nice clothes. There was no more fancy hotel rooms. It was just rob somebody and get high. So you're and not even, you stopped even hustling at this point, like selling? Everything, or, it was just about getting high. Or were you still selling? To, yeah, I'm selling. I'm, to, I'm selling. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm. But you're not stacking. But No, I'm not stacking money. I'm not saving money. It's just, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, some people, they just sell to do. I, yeah. You know, I, I know how that goes. Yeah, when I'm, does, I'm, I'm just selling to do. Mm -hmm. for a while and then people like I go through phases man and um I remember the realization of what I become happened in court because now I'm I'm catching cases like every month you know what I mean I'm catching and it was I, and, yeah and I remember one of the judges in Dorchester court said he looked at the charge and then he looked at my record and I remember he was like so this is drugs right and the courtroom laughed and I just remember the embarrassment that I felt. Mm. And I just, at that moment, I knew what I'd become. And then my first time trying to go to detox, leaving there in an hour. And then the people, the, the type of people you start hanging around changes. Your, your objectives to life change. Everything that um, was once important to you is not important anymore. I just lived to feel different. And feeling different equated to being high. Those same, those same animalistic behaviors, those same measures that I was willing to take it to while being involved in street violence and gangs and stuff, now I'm willing to do it just to get high. Mm. Like I'm doing robberies, I'm doing home evasions, I'm, you know what I mean, robbing banks, you know what I mean? Not like robbing banks like what you see in movies, but mm -hmm. like with a little note, like, mm -hmm. like, like I'm, you know, and then. And then that runs out. And next thing you know, you're stealing from your mother's purse. You're stealing from your kids. You know what I mean? Like, I've, I've um, went to the lows of the lows. You Does know? the guilt and shame dig you deeper? Absolutely. You know what I mean? And it's just about avoiding yourself, avoiding responsibility, yeah. and not looking at yourself. That's really what it was about for me. I was in hell. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was just like, you know, you, you think being in jail... You think being in jail or being in prison is hell, you know what I mean? Or I've been shot numerous times. I've been stabbed, you know what I mean? You're like You think these situations are hell, but having to do something that you don't want to do on an everyday basis and just the demoralizing part of the whole situation, it's like, I know better. I came from better, but now this is, this is how I feel normal now. Mm -hmm. The people I ended up being around and the things that I ended up doing, the conversations I ended up having, like... You know, my, my world was flipped upside down. So all these stealing charges, larceny under 250s, all these crappy charges, you know, all this, you know, what they call them in court, junkie cases. That's what, you know, they, right. that's what they call them. Because it's like almost you're regressing as a criminal. Yeah, yeah, it's, man. It's fucked up as it is, yeah. bro. It's like, oh, I didn't know we can swear. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. As long as it's not. <laughs> that's when, you know, but then, see, sniffing, see, the thing about sniffing dope mm -hmm. before the fentanyl came and sniffing coke. I mean, it's all bad, but you could be around somebody sniffing dope for two or three years, and if they have a way of income, you might not know it. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I was a closet dope sniffer for a while, and then, you know, like, rumors started coming out, like, you'll sniff dope with a girl, and then she'll tell somebody, then mm. it's like... It's like right. People start talking, now. Hey, I, I, I'm getting high. <laughs> you know, but it was like... But then I got introduced to crack for the first time. And that is what, see, I thought my world was flipped upside down. That is what rocked everything. Like what dope did to me in the six years of sniffing, crack did that in a week. Yeah, <laughs> you so know? that went downhill fast. Yeah, man. Um, I found my, um, there's a word that I can't think of, but I found my thing. Mm -hmm. Like, what, you know, and um, I was willing to just like, I became, a real animal for that. Your hygiene, everything that like it was just done. You know, um, secondary. The beginning of the end during the dope period and the fall off after my father. I made my second daughter, and 
during the crack part, I made my son. And I was introduced to treatment. I was introduced to drug rehabilitation programs. I was introduced to getting sectioned and all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. I, you know, um, but still can't get clean, clean, serious for a serious amount of time. Um, just like kids play doctor and play house, I could, you know, I, I would play clean. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it was just never in my heart. Like I just the pain didn't get great enough yet, and. I just really, I think um, there was just a hopelessness of it. Yeah. I didn't think that I could ever bounce back. And even if I did bounce back, I'll never be looked at the same again. It was almost like it was pointless. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I remember thinking like that. It was just, it's pointless now. And then that's the importance of the meetings. That's the importance of the commitments. A commitment is when um, recovering alcoholics or addicts go to centers and speak to um people in active addiction or right there on the fence trying to get their stuff together in treatment. And um, and then you start hearing stories and then you start hearing this kind of stuff. And it's like, people do, people do bounce back. People do get their life back. I had so many situations where I relapsed or I used in a program or I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. I just, I just really got tired of living that way. It was like, this ain't working. And you've been clean how long now? Going on five years almost? Yeah, in August, August 3rd, God willing, I'll have five years. Will you get clean and start to, did you have to reach a bottom or? I had a relapse after five months of just playing recovery, acting mm -hmm. like I was in it and your I was body just was straddling clean, the but fence. Your mind, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I'm closet smoking crack and I'm back mm. sniffing dope and me and my son's mother are just back to doing the thing. She's back seeing guys for money and stuff like that while pregnant with my son, man. It was just, just, the bottom of the bottom, man. And um, I just remember one time being in the car with my mother and her playing this gospel song. And I just remember, like, it just hit me, man, wow. you know? And it just hit me, like, I knew what I was doing was wrong. And I just knew that with all the information I had and everything that I came from, I just, I, that's like, I believe wow. that if I stopped using, my life could get better. That's when I actually wow. believed it. So it was more of a, like, an aha moment. So we call it, yeah. Like so we call it, yeah. Rock, we, rock we, bottom going to jail or. During my nine years of using, I've been shot numerous times at my house. I've been stabbed. I've been. You would think those would be yeah, the bottom. I lost my, you know what I mean? My dad died during this, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I lost friends. I see, like, all types of stuff. Like, that wasn't it, man. It's, it's something that happens to the alcoholic or the addict where I try to tell them, like, yeah, that's cool. It, it can, you know, the, the, the motivating factors, the kids, the family, mm -hmm. the wife, the husband, blah, 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 blah. But none of that stuff makes you be like, nah, I'm done. It just, for me, it was like a click where it was like, I believed in this thing. I believe that if I stop using, my life will get better. I think that for a few, for a couple of times, because it's rocky in the beginning when you stop using, yeah. you're still in the fog. Mm -hmm. I stopped using and I still feel like shit. How long does that last? It, go, it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. For me, I had a lot going on. I had a um, son's mom out there running around, different guys pregnant with my son, doing what she's doing. And then she got sectioned. I'm in love, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm codependent. I'm going through what I'm going through. I'm worried about her more than I'm worried about my own children. Mm. And minus that, I'm, I'm coming off of dope. I'm coming off of crack. You know what I mean? Like, I'm at an all-time low. The medicine that they give you, it maintains you. The prayer made me believe. I can't explain, you know what I mean, like, how it happens, but dealing with that obsession in your mind and those bad thoughts, the prayer, man, and then it was like, Throughout this whole thing that I've been telling you, every time I got into that holding cell since before drugs, every time I've been in a situation, I always knew who to go to. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a very spiritual person. You know what I mean? I am a Christian man. And yeah. um, like I told you, it start, I started with the church. I grew yeah. up in that thing. I always knew where to go. And, um, and this time, I just didn't want to go back out. Like, I'm in the detox facility, I'm in the holding, and I just don't want to go back out there. The belief that if I stop using, my life will get better, I can't see it right now with this, you know, two weeks sober, <laughs> you know right. what I mean? But I believe in it now, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it's like, all right, that means that I got to hold on. Yeah, the medicine was great. The medicine's cool and all that kind of stuff. And 
you know what I mean? The groups, things that take your mind off things. But in the end, what made me hold my seat was God and prayer. But then that transformed into time. Time is the ultimate healer. Time is the ultimate, um, whatever that word is, but Cure yeah, it, time yeah. just kept, time kept getting longer and longer and longer. And before you know it, you're thinking about different things. You're feeling different. And I just remember, man, being in this process and praying and getting back in touch with God and my passion came back. I'm writing mm -hmm. again. Before you know it, I'm coming up on like three months sober, man. And I've been here before, but right. I've never been here with God before. We call them spiritual awakenings and the result of having a spiritual awakening, like this 12-step process. But my spiritual awakenings were a, a little more different because I had crazy warrants. I had crazy stuff that I had to go clear. And because of my atrocious record mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff, it was like, I always thought I was going to get held, and then I'm around people that got Kalanapins or they got Suboxone. This is before MATs um, were allowed in jail. So mm -hmm. it's like, it got to the point before I made that choice to get sober and stay in treatment. I was going to jail or getting sectioned every three weeks. It was to the point that people on the unit knew I was coming. They were like, yo, when you come bring, get right, these right. Jordans, wear this. What you gonna come like? It was to that point. I was bringing so much stuff into the jail, and it was like at this point, it was like my faith was tested. It was mm -hmm. like if you believe that if you stop using, that things are gonna get better, and God got you, then why do you need to tuck Suboxone to go to court? Why do you need to tuck Kalana pins and Xanax to go to court? Mm -hmm. If you're doing this sober thing now, and you trust me, and go to court and fix your warrants and. You know, I don't know if, if you're that person where it's like the, the, the amount of anxiety and, the, and that expression of butterflies in your mm -hmm. stomach going to court to clear your warrants, man. And um, feeling like an idiot once I go through the metal detectors. Like, I should have brought that stuff. Man. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That's, could, it's, it's a that's tough thing to do to yeah, walk it's, through it's, those it's, doors willingly knowing what's yeah, coming. Yeah, it's man. like canteen and, and, and uh, I should have brought in. And, and then you go to court, man. And, um, we, some people call it a higher power, mine's is God. You go into the judge and they call your name and then you go into the bench and then you walk up to the podium and they look and they read this onslaught of misdemeanor crap charges with, along with your serious record and, mm -hmm. you know, stealing um, tablets from hospitals and taking cars and all this crazy stuff, man. You know what I mean? And car chases for no reason, like, right. like your Whitey Bulger, you're running with... <laughs> You know what I mean? A 40 of crack on you. Like, it, it's crazy. Yeah. And they're reading these charges. And um, and then they go, all right, hold them for remand, and we'll bring it back up. And then you go, and this is where it clicked for me. They hold me. Well, and then they call you back in for the second hearing. They believe in what you're doing. Yeah. It's like, his urine's clean. He got four months sober. He made it this far. He came in here willingly with the program with him, they're here vouching for him. And with your atrocious record and all of this stuff, they take the cuffs off you. Okay. And they let you go back. And it's, it's like, feeling. this is real, it works. I hadn't experienced, I had my son in that process, but I haven't, like, I wasn't be able to be there when my son was born. I just knew, you know, um, because I had, I had that situation happen to me, and I remember feeling so happy and grateful. Yeah. And I was like, I'm never going back. I'm never going back. Was that the last time in the courthouse? I had to keep clearing stuff up, okay. and then I was on probation for a while. I never had to worry about a urine being dirty and yeah. trying to flush it. Like, I'm going through there like I work at the courthouse saying right. hi to people now. Right. You know what I mean? Like I completed a probation. When you're doing the right thing. It's a different I, com I, I completed yeah. probation. I got my pro probation officer's right. number yeah. in my phone. Hey, like, yeah. like just asking questions. Like, you know what I mean? Like life was changing. So what they do? Wrap all that up kind of with a so probation? They, so when you got a uh, yeah, when you got deal? Yeah, they do you suspend it. So they call that a global resolution. Mm, okay. A global resolution. I had... um. Higgum Court, that was Plymouth County. I had um, okay, so you bouncing around different courts. I had like mad different counties, charges from all like, over the place, and all these things. And um, they gave me a global resolution. But before that happened, the most important part of the question that you asked, um, 
now with everything that we were doing, me and my son's mother, you know what I mean, before it all came to an end, and she gets sectioned, she's handcuffed to a bed, I can't be there. I remember my last time using, I was in the program, and I had a, res I had a, I had a reservation, and my last time using, I was, I was, I, I meant everything that I was doing, because I actually went in on July 3rd, my sober date should have been July 3rd, mm. I made it all the way to August 3rd and made a bad choice in a program, uh, and um, this was a, a God moment for me, it was like, I had three options that night, when I, after finishing what I was doing, and I went back to the program, I could either not go in there, yeah, I could either not go and just go back to what I was doing. I could play the game and flush my system and, and act like everything's okay and I'm just late because of some delusional reason that my addict mind believes in. Or for the first time, I can be honest. And that night I was honest. And that was, that was August 3rd. That was my last time using. And before that situation happened in court where they took the court, the, after they, they took the cuffs off me, a group came in to just do a group, something like that, inside the program I was in. And this group just happened to show babies being born with withdrawals on the mm. TV. And um, baby, you know what I mean? My, the size of that McDonald's cup and yeah. they're shivering and, and twitching. And it scared the hell out of me, man, because I knew the stuff that we were doing. And I knew, and it was like, if she's detoxing, the baby's detoxing in there with her. And, I just felt so bad about, you know what I mean, being an influence on her choices and stuff like that. I do take responsibility yeah. for that. I prayed a lot, for, prayed for a lot of things in my life, and um, I actually just prayed for him to be okay. And after that situation, August 3rd, and, and, and the feeling that honesty brought me, what happened, and then seeing that and that prayer, I was like, you know, this is serious, man. So that was, that was, the, that was, the, that, that was the little fear that, that smacked me into yeah. reality that your son's going through this stuff. And it was like, it was like a, a chance that maybe for your dad, like, you know what I mean? Your son's born, like carrying this legacy for him, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, man, it was like, it's about business now. It's, a, it's, it's about business. And then August 11th, despite all, um, all odds against us, you know what I mean? He was born completely healthy. He didn't need methadone. He didn't twitch. He didn't do this. He was really healthy. And then the court situation happened. Mm -hmm. So I was believing in this process now. My life yeah. was getting better. And then writing started happening. And then I'm into more, I'm getting more freedom in programs. And, you know, I'm getting more time sober. And, you know, I'm finding out myself. And, and I was just, and I was reinventing myself. The meetings. Why do you think that's important, and is that something that so you would it keeps you in the loop? Somebody that wants to be clean, you know, right? They just got out of say they just got out of prison. They're clean, you know, physically. Now they come to the streets. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot going on. There's a lot more distractions. Why would you recommend that puts you around numerous people with experience dealing with what exactly you're dealing with at that time? Just like me, mm -hmm. I became a believer because. I believed in what these people were saying. I heard it enough. It was like, you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like the, everybody's lying in here, right. you know? But the meeting is important because it gets you in the loops. You know what I mean? It gets you, it gets you around people that are living like this. You know what I mean? If, if I go to church, I'm around people that are involved in church things. If I go to a volunteer shelter and I'm involved with this volunteer group, I'm probably, I'm around people that are doing these things. If I go to the bar, I'm around people. So right. it's like the, the, the meetings, you're being around. Not everybody's there for the same thing, but yeah. most of the people, you sit in the front and you raise your hand. It's like there are people that have been exactly where you are that care. Yeah. And the only way that I can stay sober, me, even with my four years or whatever, it really depends on me helping you with your, with your two weeks or your yeah. month. Like, we need each other. And it's like, by me helping you with your problems and all that kind of stuff, I got another day sober. Because it's 24 hours. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to get 24 hours. You trying to get 24 hours. The only difference is I might have four years and you got 30 days. But we both have the same dilemma. Mm -hmm. We both trying to get 24 hours. 
and and that puts you around that type of energy. And when you're around that type of energy, it rubs off. And some people got to do more research and do more homework. And if they don't die, God bless them, and they come back, and that same person, maybe a different face, is there willing to do the same thing. Yeah. You know, so that's why they, that's the importance of meetings. So let's talk about the music now, what you've been doing with the music these past couple, few years. You've been doing a lot. So why don't you talk about what you got going on? What's been like your favorite part about the music since then? Maybe some cool experiences that you probably would have never got if it um, weren't for the music. Maybe meeting people, something like that. Just meeting people that I that I grew up listening to. The magic never went away for me. Yeah. Like I talked about in the beginning, the magic of being on the radio or being on TV, meeting some of these people that I only see their name on a CD or see them on a TV screen, and then you're around these type of people and they're talking to you. Right. Just the fit, like it will never get old, a complete stranger knowing who you are only for your music mm. and your lyrics and giving you love for that. And you could be having the worst day ever. Mm -hmm. And someone that you don't know sees you in a store or sees you, whatever, mm -hmm. and they they ask you for a picture or they, they know a song and it's like, you really know my stuff. Yeah, <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, that that that's priceless. And I don't think that, you know, that will ever go away. But then it's when you get these messages from complete strangers who mm. are really listening and they're where you used to be. And they're saying that your music gives them hope in this situation. So that's the magic. And I pray that there's more magic for me to see because mm -hmm. on this journey, there's definitely more disappointments than celebrations. Mm -hmm. And a lot of smoke and mirrors are revealed, but mm -hmm. I play the game. And yeah. um, I'm in it to win it and I'm dedicated to it and came too far to quit now. Absolutely. You know, I got low moments where you know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I'll tell Shorty or I'll tell somebody like, eh, maybe we just need yeah. to write a book. Maybe I need to be a motivational speaker. <laughs> you know, like I go through it, man, but and then it'd be a, a complete stranger. He don't even know. And he'll just make you change your whole thing, you know, so. What's your yeah. favorite part about the whole music process? Is it the studio? Is it live performances? Is it just writing? What's your, your favorite part of it? It's 50-50, mm -hmm. creating it and then someone appreciating it. Yeah, that's my favorite part. Someone appreciating it. Mm -hmm. Someone, and this might sound, no, like, I don't want to say higher ups or, you know what I mean? People that are, are doing what you want to do that have gone through the hoops you have gone through. Some that in society will say they're validated or the way that social media, like, mm -hmm. Someone just out of the blue, you know what I mean, acknowledges you, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, that can change everything. And that's why for me, you know, I mean, I'm a, you know what I mean, small fish in this big pond, but even for the smaller fish, right. I'm always showing love because I know what that can do for somebody, yeah. you know what I How mean? How important is it to collaborate? I saw you just release something with OT The Rail. It's the experience. It's, mm -hmm. all, it's the experience, but um, you learn that it's, we're in a day and time, see, my age in the era of music that I come from, collaborating, there was no social media and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So why, why I say that, so like, let's say if I did a song with Snoop Dogg in the year 2001 and we shot a video for it. If MTV and BET or E or all these other channels puts it up, I'm in. Mm -hmm. right. It doesn't make a difference. Like, it, I don't need Snoop Dogg to push this thing or put it on his mm -hmm. Instagram page because gotcha. that didn't exist. Yep. It got the game got like, like the game's harder now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's relationships. It's building with people. It's like you're better off building your own brand first. You know what I mean? But collaborating with people that really rock with you, it's very important because it's relationships. If this person really rocks with you, that might open another door of where you're trying to go. Like OT yeah. The Real, he put me on his platform. Right. He put me on his page. That means his 
everything that he's worked for up to this moment, he doesn't mind sharing that mm. with you. Just so people, I mean, right. then it's so, up to you. It's like if the people like you or not, right. they like you or not. That's not my problem. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, but it's like just that shot. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you got good guys like that in the game. And then you got people that are not like that, that are just take your money. <laughs> like, yeah, right. you know? well, I think so, it's good, too, that yeah. it, it could bring people together that normally wouldn't be brought together. You know Resources. I mean? Yeah. Resources, man, because we're all, we all, um, at some point, we all have the same dream. Mm -hmm. And when another artist can recognize that hunger in you and see that it's real and see that there's talent behind it, you know what I mean? And it's like, I'll give you a shot, but then, you know. So you got a favorite thing that you've done as an artist? Not yet, but I am proud that I have a, um, I'm in position right now to have a company and something from, like, if I, if, if I walked away from this thing right now, I leave with a brand. Mm -hmm. I leave with something that a stranger would buy. Got you. I like that. That's my favorite thing. Talk about the City Hall thing that you did. Oh Just yeah! Recently, Shout out my man Mathematics. Cool. Um, he's always making those type of that is, yeah. I have zero to do with that. Like oh, my job experience, like City Hall. Um, I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, I had I I I've been in a couple weird places, not weird, different places mm -hmm. performing hip hop music. Right, unconventional. Yeah, and it's like. I have this trick, man, where I'll just find a space in the back of the room, man, and I'll just focus on it, mm -hmm. and I'm acting like I'm rapping to people that are failing me. And, yeah. And I engage with the crowd and stuff like that, but it's, you know, um, as an artist, me, I keep it on me, mm -hmm. um, where I'm um, self-conscious. I, I, you know what I mean? I yeah. care what people think, man. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm, I'm all in my head all the time, man. You know what I mean? And um yeah, so you're going through that, you know what I mean? And it's like, is this gonna is it, is this gonna pop or is it gonna bust? You know what I mean? And most of the time people appreciate it. And yeah, man, that was that was a cool experience just to do something different and breaking barriers for just showing people what's in this city and um hopefully it's opening more doors. How important has music been to you maintaining your freedom, do you think? It's all tied in. Music I, I without music, I probably don't have the sobriety time that I have. Mm -hmm. Without music, if I don't have the sobriety time, that means that I'm back to my old ways because yeah. drugs saved my life. Using drugs saved my life. If I didn't start using drugs, I would have either killed someone, caught a RICO charge, got hit with the feds, like everything would have been different because of the level of crimes that I was wow. doing. Once I started using drugs, it brought me to a lower level of life where I'm doing lower level crimes. Mm -hmm. Once I started doing those things, like it introduced me to treatment. Treatment got me back to myself. So I believe it's all God's plan in the end of yeah. the day, you know what I mean? And um, it all ties in one, Absolutely. you know? And I think that's, even with the, the prison, the recovery, it's all like a self-discovery journey. Like what's mm. something that you've discovered about yourself that you think is important? Throughout um, the you know hard t trials, tribulations, ups and downs, man. That I can actually help someone. Mm. You know what I mean? That if I'm focused on it and I'm being mature and I'm not just worried about what I want, I'm very resourceful and I'm very helpful to somebody. That um, it's a good feeling. Yeah, it's a good feeling to help somebody yeah. for sure. It's one of the I think one of the best feelings there is is right. actually giving and, and not taking. You know, talk a little bit about. What you got going on with the music now? Is there so right, a project that's yeah, out man, that you right want to promote? Now, one yeah, right up, now, man, it. it's um, Exit Hell. We're about to launch um, the online store, Exit Hell. It's been a long time coming. The project is doing really well, 11 tracks. And I don't know where this is going, but mm -hmm. it feels right. I'm doing way less than I did the previous years. And I'm saving a lot more money, but my investments are becoming more smarter. And I'm investing more into the brand and myself. So exit hell. Um, it's a mindset. I'm leaving hell. You know what I mean? And um, just trying to show other people the light. And that's what it means. You know what I mean? Just this is this is how I did it. This worked for me. And yeah, I'm currently back in the studio working on music. We was already working on music mm -hmm. while this was being made. So, you know, um, 
now I got some goals and some things that I'm trying to do this time. So we're gonna see what happens. But it's well, exit hell right now. Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about the the goals. What do you got for you know short term goals, long term? goals? Um, short term goals, man. Um, I would love to perform at a Celtics halftime show, man. Mm. Um, you know, I just I performed at an arena in Foxwoods, man. Um, you know, with CES promo like UFC fighting and. I just got an opportunity to do that again. Um, I would love to, um, you know what I mean, perform at Joiner Fest. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like these things, like these, um, and people would want you there. Not like you, I'm paying to do it or something like that. Like, it's well, you like, add val you're adding value to something like yeah, that. You know what I mean? Right. So these are just goals and aspirations for me. But to get this um, store going, get this LLC business going, and um, really take this to the next level on a professional um on a professional status that's um that's what we're going right now but working on more music and collaborating with artists um if you're in the loops and you're in the rooms and you're around the people you don't know what's gonna come so not chasing the superficial mm. you know what i mean not just trying to chase what's lit and what's going on you know what i mean trying to piggyback off of something else somebody else did like earning your own and building your own that's where exit fame's at now absolutely yeah absolutely i feel like you definitely built something of value that other people should perceive as valuable as being worth you know paying you to be on their ticket and instead of like you said having maybe to pay to yeah, be on yeah, something yeah. you know how it is and um but let's just talk a little bit one more time about the prison what, what's the worst part of prison if you're trying to tell somebody deter them from going away, well, how would you explain it? It never happened to me, but the people you love can die while you're in there. Mm. And I was grateful enough not to have to go through that. Yeah. But it was one of my biggest fears in there. And it is a possibility once you're in there that the people you love dearest could die while you're in jail. And you, you're completely powerless. What advice would you give to somebody that just came home today and you know about maintaining their freedom? Is it finding? a passion like you with the music what would you suggest no matter what you got to get in touch with a higher power mm -hmm. that's what i agree you 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 your spiritual you you got to develop some type of spiritual principles because in the way the world is now dictated off of people with emotions driving being in a store you're dealing with nothing but ungoverned un spiritually ungoverned people all around you mm -hmm. and any one of these ungoverned spiritually people can take you out and put you in a situation to be back in a cage all off emotions the only things that regulate your emotions is when you have spiritual principles to follow i'm not saying you you know what i mean your god has to be the god that i serve but you got to get in touch with a higher power that would be my be, advice uh, can't be you <laughs> yeah it can't it can't it just can't you just can't be out here like that because the rules that we go by in the system compared to out here. You know, the way the world is, man, you look at the news, you know, like, who knows what's going to be on the news tomorrow? It's absolutely. something that I can't fathom that's going to blow your mind. Yeah, absolutely. Because we are around people that are spiritually ungoverned. Well, man, you're doing great, man. <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking forward to following your journey, the bounce back journey. It's been great watching you from, from a distance and it's been even better to meet you in person. And I appreciate I, I, you having me here. Yeah, man. I appreciate you coming through, man. If um, if there's any last words or maybe something you wanted to touch on, maybe we didn't get a chance to talk about. Um, nah, man. Exit Hell out now. Um, me and my guy Beast we're working on this book, Exit Hell Never Go Back, the online store. It's coming, man. And um, yeah, man. Those those dreams and goals and aspirations. I'm just trusting the process at this point. Like, don't give up, man. Yeah. You're talented as hell, bro. You and you can rap. Just talk a little bit before I let you go about like the Massachusetts hip hop scene now, man. And what do you think has been like my years of being a spectator and participating? I mean, I've there's been golden years, I guess, for New England music, but for me, I think this is the biggest that New England has ever been with music. Having people like Millie's, having people like Bia, Joyner, Lucas. Cousin Stiz, you know what I mean? Smoke Bolger, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Even like people like Benzino being on Drink Champs and just bringing awareness to Boston, man. Um, 
and just all the things that are happening. And then the new talent, the new life, the new crews, you know what I mean? The people like Nay Speaks and yeah. you know what I mean? Sir Clocks and Key, man. Um, the list goes on. And then just the organic movements like Feed the Family and um, mm -hmm. just being able to, just being able to like, contribute my little two cents to something like yeah. that you know what i mean and um just watching this whole thing happen you know what i mean and uh, and just being a part of it man is um it's dope man and then making relationships like you know like when my guy ate zip or then a person like mathematics you know what i mean mm -hmm. like it's it's a it's a beautiful thing man it's 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 dope and being in a position where people recognize you for it and and, and hold you dear for that. So I believe that we are in a re renaissance for New England music. And I don't know where this is going, but I'm just happy I'm a part of it. Absolutely. You know, so it's Absolutely. dope. And just so just to kind of wrap everything up, too. And I know it's all about, you know, the 12 steps, you know, that last step, giving back and everything. What advice would you give to somebody right now that's still struggling with those demons? Check into a treatment place, man. I would say check into a treatment place. Yeah. And pray, you that's know it. what I mean, and and that's easier said than done. But that's where Absolutely. it started for me. That's where it started for me. I checked in willingly by myself, not for nobody else, mm -hmm. and then I prayed, and then I trusted the process. Absolutely. So why don't you tell people where they can find you? Run down the social media. Oh, everything is Exit Fame. Okay. E X I T F A M E. Um, the store's up. The website's up. You know what I mean. Shout out Paul Armstrong, man, and and um, shout out the team, Tunnel Vision, man, and. Stat Gold and Mathematics and, and the people involved, man, you know, um, there's so many people, Ashura Tech, you know what I mean, Cobb's Detailing, like, there's a lot of little pieces that make yeah. this thing happen, and of course the family, so. Absolutely, it's more than just exit fame, it's, oh, the, yeah, it's yeah, the whole it's, team. Yeah, it's the whole thing. Absolutely, guys, thanks for tuning in. Yo, once again, I appreciate you no coming doubt. through, bro, it's been a good time talking to you. Guys, it is what it is, what's next is what you make it. On that note, this is the Bounce Back Podcast, B. Luke. Exit fame. You are ready. We are. Bounce back. You got a moment. When they see you down the